Alors, bienvenue, bienvenue à vous tous, à vous toutes, à cette première édition nord-américaine des Journées internationales de la culture scientifique, Science and You, organisée cette année par l'ACFAS. Je me nomme Véronique Morin, vous me connaissez peut-être dans les milieux de journalisme scientifique dans lesquels j'évolue depuis plusieurs dizaines d'années, je ne dirai pas combien de dizaines d'années. Je vais vous laisser deviner, ça me fait vraiment plaisir d'être avec vous euh, en cet après-midi pour vous présenter une série de conférences sur les transformations que la communication scientifique a subies à travers le numérique. Tour à tour, vous entendrez des communications, des communicateurs, des experts qui se spécialisent dans la communication auprès des jeunes, des experts qui se spécialisent dans les fausses nouvelles et qui essaient de les combattre. Dans des, aussi, vous allez entendre des communicateurs qui communiquent de milieux extrêmement difficiles, extrêmes et extrêmement difficiles à communiquer. Et vous entendrez aussi des gens qui trouvent que la science, c'est finalement bien drôle parfois. Mais d'abord, J'invite le président de la CFAS, M. Frédéric Bouchard, à venir me rejoindre et à vous dire quelques mots. On l'accueille. Monsieur le président du CRSNG, M. Mario Pinto, distingués invités, euh, amis et euh, nos amis sur l'Internet, amis internautes. Je vous remercie tout d'abord d'être ici pour assister à cette première édition nord-américaine des Journées internationales de la culture scientifique. Lorsque l'Université de Lorraine a demandé à l'ACFAS d'organiser cet événement, nous avons tout de suite saisi la balle au bon parce que euh, l'ACFAS existe depuis 1923 et depuis le début, euh, la mission de l'ACFAS est de faire la promotion de l'importance de la recherche pour les individus et les collectivités. Et ça, ça passe beaucoup par la culture scientifique. Et donc, depuis notre fondation, on s'intéresse non seulement à la création de la connaissance, mais à son partage. Et à ce titre-là, le Québec a excellente réputation en culture scientifique. Ses magazines pour les publics de tous âges, différentes organisations, des musées, des activités, bref, tous les secteurs de la société ont accès, on souhaiterait plus accès, on souhaiterait plus de ressources pour cet accès-là, mais ont accès à des contenus de culture scientifique de très haute qualité. Et donc, c'est une occasion pour nos médiateurs de sciences, nos communicateurs de sciences, de partager leur expertise et euh, d'apprendre aussi des bons coups de euh, leurs collègues à l'étranger. Et donc, j'espère que vous aurez beaucoup de plaisir à échanger entre vous et surtout, si possible, construire de nouveaux projets, élaborer de nouveaux projets avec vos nouveaux collègues de partout à travers le monde. Parce que, comme la recherche s'internationalise, quelque part, c'est normal que la culture scientifique s'internationalise aussi, lorsque c'est pertinent. Et en plus, avec le numérique, qui va être un thème récurrent durant euh, les prochains jours, on a de nouveaux outils pour faciliter ces partenaires-là, ces partenariats-là. Et donc, c'est dans cet esprit que nous avons conçu cet événement et sa programmation, avec pour objectif de partager nos expertises communes, les bons coups, mais aussi les mauvais coups, parce qu'on innove seulement quand on accepte de faire des erreurs, et pourquoi pas développer des nouveaux projets. Je vous invite aussi, euh, dans les prochains jours, les bénévoles auront euh, une déclaration euh, de, pour la de la Commission canadienne de l'UNESCO sur l'importance de la culture scientifique, dans nos vies individuelles et collectives. Et donc, je vous invite à prendre une de ces euh, déclarations-là. Et euh, si vous êtes, je présume que vous allez être en accord avec son contenu, je vous inviterai à la signer et à nous la remettre pour que nous puissions communiquer. So I invite you to read the declaration of the UNESCO so that uh, and, and you can even sign it. I'd like to invite you to read the uh, to read uh, the UNESCO declaration. And I'd like to thank the organizers. Thank you uh, to all the organizers. Thank you to all the uh, people that participate, not only in this room, but also uh, through the Internet. Les bénévoles et organisateurs. So apart from the volunteers and the organizers, such an activity is not possible without our um, sponsors and partners that really commit to our activities. I would like to thank our partners. Without them, this would not be possible. First, we have a Patrimoine Canadien, Heritage Canada. We have the uh, National Research and Science Council. 
the um, Department of Economy, Science and Innovation of Quebec, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, the McGill University, and the Lorraine University that allowed us to organize this first North American edition of our conference. Uh, Tourisme Montréal, the General Consulate of France in Quebec, Savoir Faire Linux, but mostly thank you to each and every one of you, all of the stakeholders of the science culture of here and elsewhere that help us develop this culture uh, before our audience in our society. Finally, I'd like to invite you that the next edition of the Journée Internationale de la Culture Scientifique will happen in 2018 in Beijing in China. I was told that there was going to be uh, less uh, construction work at that event. I can't guarantee you that, however. So this will be the result of a partnership between the University of Lorraine, the NAIS, National Academy of Innovation Strategy in China, and more information will be available uh, on our website, uh, scienceandu.com. So here's the address, science-and-u.com. So we are happy to welcome today the Chinese delegation. Welcome. I would like to wish you an excellent uh, conference, uh, very interesting deliberations, and we wish you good luck in the sharing of passion of science. Thank you. Thank you. And now the Minister of Sciences of Canada, the Honorable Christy Duncan, also wanted to share a few words. and. Uh, there she is uh, through this video session. Thank you for having organized this very important event. Thank you also to the participants uh, in the room, but also uh, to all of those that are passionate of science culture. So the mandate of the ACFAS is to promote research and innovation within the francophone space. This mandate also uh, is connected with the objectives of the federal government in relation to sciences. We understand the power of science to transform society from clean air and water to food security and technological advancements. Science affects all aspects of Canadians' lives. And we share your commitment to communicating science and scientific knowledge to all Canadians. This conference brings professionals from different scientific disciplines together to discuss how we can make science meaningful to everyday Canadians. This theme links very well to the Choose Science campaign we launched recently. We believe that by giving Canadians the opportunity to be curious and to choose science, we can make a better Canada and a better world for everyone. I truly believe that the key is working together at events such as this. Ensemble, nous pourrons définir. Together, we will be able to define a national vision for sciences for the betterment of life of all Canadians. I know that this is going to be a long process, and there is a lot of work ahead of us in order to establish a clear vision, but I am sure that we are all going to succeed with the support of our governmental partners as well as the uh, associations such as the ACFAS. I would have liked to be uh, attending today, but I still wish you excellent uh, deliberations, a great conference. Thank you, and great success to each and every one of you. Thank you. So one of our very important uh, partners, a uh, sponsor for the uh, funding of science in Canada is the um, Natural Science and Engineering Council. I'd like to invite Mr. Koto, who's going to uh, come and tell us a few words. So I'm in my venue and I cannot resist the acoustics in this magnificent theater. So, welcome and bienvenue, welcome. 
Fremde, étranger, stranger. J'ai dit que j'allais danser avec vous. <laughs> And I said I was going to dance with you. Yes. Happy to see you, Blyborester Stay. Now everybody, welcome. Bienvenue, welcome. Zou cabaret, tu cabaret, à cabaret. Je m'excuse, mais je ne pouvais pas. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Good afternoon, everyone. C'est un honneur pour moi d'assister à cette importante. It is a great honor uh, to uh, be invited to be at this conference. So the NRSC is very happy to be a partner with this day, Science and You. So I want to talk about the science culture and what we can all, we can all do sorry, for the development of the science culture. In a number of presentations, I've shared it with scientists and a great many non-scientists. Because when we say the word science, something happens. Often people think in terms of school subjects, biology, physics, chemistry, etc. In fact, there's been an incredible convergence of research across physical, biological, and digital realms. And a confluence of these worlds, we are very fortunate to live in the fourth industrial revolution. It seems clear to me that building science culture will play a role in helping both maximize and equalize the benefits from this revolution. Diversity is key and equality of opportunity is absolutely necessary. So how do we build a sense of science culture? How do we get a deeper appreciation and understanding of science beyond the simple word association, I mentioned a word a, a little while ago. My commitment to science culture and passing knowledge to younger generations has been lifelong. I work to pass my knowledge to younger generations, such, such as my little brother, Joshua, shown here, my high school students, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows. Of course, this mission has also involved my two daughters, and when I was professor of chemistry at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, I often took them on weekends to malls across the region, and they used to help me to distribute postcards to parents and kids with experiments. The postcards showed simple science experiments that could be done at home. And I wanted to spark people's curiosity. I wanted to engage them in the basic tools of science, the scientific method at a very early age, experimentation, observation, and analysis, and conclusion. This work continued, which shows for the general public, uh, here I show our chemistry show, a magic show which we call Stinks and Bangs, which my daughter advertised as, uh, come and see my daddy blow himself up. Yeah. But we still face the basic question, where does science come from? We still have much work to do. So what's going on in this picture? I mean, this appeared recently. These are two adults dressed up in what look like large diapers. Right? Why are they wearing Halloween masks and holding a broken umbrella while talking on a phone in the middle of the woods? Ils traquent en fait un bébé panda. So they are tracking a panda baby in the Wulong Reserve in China. This baby panda soon will be uh, freed so they are uh, dressed in such a way and uh, their garments have panda uh, ur urine uh, so no pissing around here so they are collecting important uh, data this is science at work this picture uh, was uh, uh, taken by immediately uh, vital so for scientists if you have a universal understanding, this has no limits, only borders. There are no boundaries. This is Sputnik. It values objective experimentation. It is built on transparency and stresses reproducibility of results. Unfortunately, before we can convince non-scientists 
to embrace this culture, another barrier exists. For organizations such as ENSER, this issue is core to our communication efforts. Why does science matter at all? Is it necessary? Who really cares? Well, here's my answer. Science produces evidence. Research produced the knowledge that smoking leads to lung cancer. These, this photo of these boys taken in old Montreal was the norm at one time, but the research has sparked further inquiry and experimentation that has driven public policy globally to promote tobacco cessation efforts. Research produced knowledge that HIV causes AIDS. This has led to effective antiretroviral strategies and continues to inform public health efforts. This image, a year of AZT, is by the Canadian Artist Collective, general idea for patients taking massive doses of the first antiretroviral, AZT. This was a daunting daily chore. <coughs> but science paved the way for a much more effective and manageable cocktail approach. An infectious disease is now treated as a seemingly chronic disease. And transmission from infected mother to fetus when the mother is treated is not detectable. So we've come a long way. Well, what's next? How about graphene? This is a discovery that came out of the University of Manchester Labs, the latest two-dimensional carbon polymer. And I show here an experiment by Chinese researchers at Tsinghua University who fed silkworms mulberry leaves sprayed with graphene-doped water. They then harvested this super silk you see here that has been demonstrated to be both conductive and significantly stronger than the ordinary fiber. Even for scientists, maybe especially for scientists, this approach is counterintuitive. It's risky, it's disruptive, but it's exactly what we need to do and what we need to sensitize the general public to. Here's another disruptive idea. Quantum secure communications using single photons of light. This is Thomas Chen Wine's team from the University of Waterloo. I call him John Wayne because his uh, reach has been so remarkable in such a short time. This winter, very recently, Chen Wine reported the successful quantum transmission of photons from a location on the ground to this experimental airplane at NRC using quantum encryption. The photons were tagged with a code that could only be deciphered once the receiver had received the photon. Even the sender didn't know this. Right? So in other words, you don't know what you're throwing until it's caught. This is the ultimate in quantum cybersecurity, if you think about it, and speaks to the recent investment in the Canadian Space Agency of about $80 million to study quantum encryption in space, because this is a major step forward toward more ambitious plans to use satellites for quantum secure communications. This illustrates the paradox of Schrodinger's cat. So can science culture increase the receptivity to this disruptive research? What would success look like if we had a vibrant science culture? The first sign would be increased science literacy and numeracy. As shown here, nous voulons des citoyens informés. So we want to have more informed citizens now more than ever in this uh, world of alternative facts, the citizens need to be able to judge by themselves. Not the plural of anecdote. This is an installation by a Canadian artist, Mika Alexie, part of a larger series called All Numbers Are Equal. Think about that. Of course, we also want informed decision makers to make informed decisions about major challenges such as climate change and the North. Canada has done important investments in research. 
on climatic change and also on northern Nordic, northern research. Sorry, the Canadian government has invested 100 million in an important research program, which is a multidisciplinary program about the links within links about northern health and climate change. But none of it by the late Annie Potokuk. The government has also made substantial investment in building the High Arctic Research Station, shown here in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. This will open at the end of this summer. Science and scientists can and should participate in other important global challenges, such as population migration. This is the Zatari refugee camp, opened in 2012. It is the fourth largest city in Jordan, and this presents challenges and raises questions about how we can create a safe, sustainable quality of life in these unofficial but rapidly growing urban spaces. Science can play a role in providing answers. In my mind, we will have succeeded in building a robust culture when science is viewed as something mainstream, something doable. This is Captain Kirk on Star Trek who teleported himself many, hundreds of times as I watched keenly. And this is Wolfgang Tietl at the extreme left with his students from the University of Calgary, who achieved teleportation of a photon over a distance of 6.2 kilometers very recently. So teleportation is real. This is the beginning, the first experimental validation. It's Canadian, and this will be mainstream. I'm convinced, so I volunteered to be the first human to be teleported. This may be the last time you see me, so. <laughs> I'm optimistic that we can go mainstream because the nature of scientific exploration is already changing. Les données ouvertes permettent la participation. Open data allows the participation of more stakeholders. Science uh, is not only now belonging to citizens, but to scientists rather, but also to these boys in the region of Washington, D.C. They are collecting sediment data in their region. This participates in science, science culture will also evolve. In culture scientifique efficace. An efficient science culture, qualified manpower with an, an, an analytical mind. And so here we have somebody that is ready to go on the Soyuz capsule in order to reach the International Space Station. When he was a student, Mr. Hatfield received uh, an NRSC uh, uh, support. So we spot talent early. Let me finish where I started, the how of getting to science culture. I want to reference a very important report on science culture released by the Council of Canadian Academies. Le Conseil des Académies Canadiens. So this council has made several observations. They are key observations about the state of this scientific culture and how we can develop it. So the main topics presented in this report uh, support, they say uh, that we need to support the continuous science learning. We need to make sure that science become an inclusive process. And three, we need to ensure a national leadership, but also in regions. Cirque has identified science culture as the first goal of his strategic plan and positioned itself as the leader, as suggested. This is Ensoc's communication director, Christian Ariel, having a very good day and getting a charge out of science culture. In fact, ENSOC has demonstrated leadership in a number of areas flagged by the CCA report. We have spent time and effort to be a convener, connecting and mobilizing resources. Through programs such as Promo Science, we are connected to and engaging with the science outreach community. Whoops. So within the framework of the uh, Odyssey of Sciences, we have been working to uh, mobilize all of these partners. Thanks to these partners, such as ACFAS and Science Rendezvous, hundreds, uh, 100 science activities are done across the country. 
we will continue to use all the means at our disposal and our partners, all of you, to maintain these efforts. En fin de compte. Finally, people are at the core of science. And I would like to thank the ACFAS for having organized this event. Thank you for their work to make sure that we will know, better know and celebrate the science culture. Thank you and kudos to all of you. I am happy to participate in this uh, amazing event. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We can now begin our conferences. Over the next two hours, you will hear speakers uh, that will talk about uh, specific concerns in scientific communication in a digital world where attention is constantly solicited. Mine is solicited on the screen because I have to change my slides. That is an example of multitasking, doing two, three, or even four things at the same time. Our young people have their attention taken by social media. But for our first uh, two speakers, you will hear two exceptional women that work uh, in museum strategies and scientific uh, festivals to draw the attention of our youth. Please welcome first Amanda Tindall. The Science Festival of Edinburgh, a festival that is uh, going to celebrate next year its 30th anniversary. So that's 30 years of change in talking to young people and attracting their attention. Please welcome Amanda Tindall. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, uh, hello everybody. Um, yep, I'm Amanda, I'm the creative director of the Edinburgh International Science Festival. Um, to give a little bit of context, we were the world's first public celebration of science, um, launched in uh, 1989, so we celebrate our 30th birthday next year. Um, that's going to be a hell of a party. Um, we deliver a two week festival in Edinburgh um, every April. Um, which delivers content for people of all ages. It falls during the school holidays, so we don't work with schools during that festival time. Um, but we do deliver a year-round education program that um, delivers uh, science outreach activities across Scotland to about 60,000 young people. Uh, I think on Generation Science, it makes us the largest single provider of science education outreach uh, in the UK. And we've been increasingly starting to develop um, more products for teen audiences in the context of our education or of our festival programs. Um, our mission and vision is actually under review at the moment. We're very conscious that um, as an organization that's 30 years old, there's no point just sitting back and congratulating ourselves on being so old and patting ourselves on the back. Uh, we need to constantly reevaluate what we do and to try and ensure that we future-proof ourselves and that we remain top of our game for, for the next 30 years and beyond. Um, but really we aim to inspire people of all ages to um, about the wonder of, the, of science and the world around them, but more than that, um, to encourage the fostering of a scientifically literate society that understand the relevance of science to their everyday lives and are able to make informed decisions and participate in the democratic process and to help build the sustainable future that we all want to inhabit. Um, so, I'm speaking to an audience here that, that know much of this, um, and I'm here really to share my views, but also to, to learn from you. Um, we do this by reaching out to the non-engaged, so um, it's all about audience development. That sits at the, the heart of much of our programming. Um, so interest and identity-based programming is key to, to what we do to reach any specific audience uh, amongst a broad sort of plethora of, of publics, um, including trying to engage with teens. Um, I call it science by stealth, the idea that we pick something, a topic of interest, be it music or technology or, or food and drink, um, and in some respects market that to people with the science a little bit under the radar um, to, to try and reach the people that are put off by the stigma of science, as, as Mario was just saying. Um, and for us, we've been doing that increasingly through cross-disciplinary projects. 
the world's not split into little silos, and, and we don't think our programming should be either. We want to program across borders and boundaries and disciplines. Um, and have a particular interest in the art science interface and in the, and the STEAM agenda, which I know in particular um, in Canada and in the, in the US is really gathering STEAM, as they say, um, and is uh, something that in the UK is not quite as sort of top of the agenda, um, but we're really trying to champion it within the context of our festival in Edinburgh. Um, not just to foster creative thinking and innovative approaches to things, um, but now more than ever, we're really conscious of the fact that in a, in a post-truth world where facts and evidence base are not enough, uh, are not cutting the mustard, and are not shifting opinions or winning hearts and minds, that we need to create much more immersive and emotive experiences to really get to the, to the heart of things. A few examples of things that we've done in Edinburgh. Um, we've been working with the Scottish International uh, Theatre, Children's Theatre Festival, Imaginate, to commission new theatre pieces. Uh, one of those actually won the, the, the Scottish Theatre Critics Award for the best piece of young person's theatre in Scotland last year. Um, a piece around artificial intelligence aimed at 10 to 15 year olds, um, which was a great win for us. It was really getting science content taken seriously in the, in the broader cultural sphere. Uh, we did a big music gig um, three weeks ago uh, during the festival where my first foray into rock promotion saw me negotiating with an agent that um, not only uh, promotes public service broadcasting, the band that we had perform their Race for Space album live with the National Youth Choir of Scotland, but also represents Aerosmith and Guns N' Roses. So that was a, an interesting learning curve for me. So all of these things, um, choosing topics like technology, a big exhibition this year we had called Play On, looked at how technology is transforming how we spend our leisure time and play. Um, was aimed very much at trying to increase the number of, of teens um, attending our festival. We do a mini maker fair as part of our festival every year on the final day, which uh, I think my staff hate me for. After 18 days of programming, I then make them run a mini maker fair. Um, but it's a lovely way to, to finish the festival. And again, that has seen us reach a much, a much larger proportion of, of teens. But it's not enough. Um, we feel that we need a new strategy. Um, we need to really commit to tackling the hard problem of teen engagement. And to do that, we've been adopting foresight methodologies, which my, uh, my co-presenter, Kristen, will talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, that's all about asking people, young people, to make sense of the world and to be part of the solution, not the problem. We devised Fuse Lab, an innovation boot camp for um, 16 to 20-year-olds that took 70 young people on a 72-hour journey um, to Mars, obviously, not really. Um, but we asked them, um, how can you create or produce off-world solutions to real-world problems around sustainability and sustenance and transportation, um, taking them into a world where we remove some of the barriers and let their imaginations uh, run wild. Uh, and more recently, we devised Careers Hive, a project that looked to turn traditional careers fairs on their head. Um, a, delivering them to, to people between the ages of sort of 12 and 14 before they make any subject choices in Scotland, um, and much earlier than many people are being asked to, to consider career options. But again, we didn't ask what job are you going to do in 10, 15 years' time. Um, we asked how do you want to help feed the world or heal the world, fuel the world, build and connect it, uh, design and play with it. Um, again, though, I don't think this is enough. Um, next year is the Scottish Year of Young People, and we've been talking to our colleagues there in the Scottish Government, um, in youth engagement organisations, and for us, the next step is to really embrace the concept of co-creation. Um, we've been working on a blueprint for co-creation alongside our various partners. Um, and we really want to form a youth advisory panel that we'll work with year round to help devise content curated by young people for young people. Um, we've done a lot, we've had some successes, but we've still got a really long way to go. And I think trying to reinvent the wheel with a festival that's 30 years old um, can have its challenges. That 30 years of, of reputation um, are a great thing. Um, but we've had to, as I say, reinvent the wheel while it's still turning. Um, try and change things gradually. Um, 
and I think that's a good point for me to end because I know that Kristen's <laughs> going to talk about the next wave, how doing something new, bespoke and from scratch um, is what certainly I and I believe Kristen thinks is the, is the way forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda. So Amanda is having a seat. We're going to have a discussion about these new ways of engaging uh, the young public. And I'd like now to invite uh, Kristen Alford. She came, she flew from Australia to come and tell us about a new model of museums called the Museum of Discovery, which University of South Australia and will be open next year. And she is a futurist. So, in the next uh, few minutes, she will look into her crystal ball to share with us what are the new technologies that are being used to involve young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronique. <laughs> Bonjour, and thank you very much for, for having me. Um, yes, so I am the director of MOD, which is a futuristic museum of discovery. Um, we're calling ourselves MOD, not a museum of discovery as such. Um, because I wanted a place where you could imagine a 16-year-old saying to their friends, what are you doing this weekend? I'm going to MOD, we're going to hang out and see what's happening. Uh, I wanted it to be a word that um, people felt like they had some ownership of, um, that felt like it was familiar and something they could shape. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't mean anything really in English, MOD. It's, it's sort of an, almost a nothing word. So it allows people to come in early and, and shape it from the beginning. Um, our target audience is 15 to 22 year olds, so we're being very, very specific. I often say 15 plus, um, but in Adelaide the expectation is that a science centre will be a place where families go, or there will be a whole lot of interactive things where you can learn how science works, and I really want to ensure that that doesn't happen. Because the minute I get a family in with seven year olds and three year olds, I can say goodbye to my 15 year olds, and I know that this is the case from talking with other science centres around the country who have large family audiences. You know, if you've got a bunch of three-year-olds kind of playing, the 15-year-old is going somewhere else. So I'm being really strict at the moment about saying we are programming for 15 to 22-year-olds. We want it to be a space where they feel like they belong. Um, I'm also programming outside the school curriculum because the other thing I get is, oh, you're, you're programming for senior secondary school students and university students. It should be aligned to what they're learning at school so teachers can come in and bring them to visit. And I say no. I want a program for free range 15 to 22 year olds. I don't want a bunch of 30 kids coming in with a teacher. I want bunches and bunches of five, six, seven um, kids coming in with their friends. So it's a different way of, of thinking. It means we have to think about how we engage schools very, very differently um, from, a, I guess, a more traditional method, which is around designing school visits. It's not what you know. That's one of our taglines, and I think that goes to the heart of what we're trying to create. So firstly, it's not the science centre that you know and that you're familiar with, um, but also the content is not what you see, so it's not part of the curriculum. Um, our cycle of exhibitions is based on our local um, indigenous, indigenous Aboriginal seasons, which means we have three long seasons and a very short spring. Um, so that means we have three major exhibitions and a small festival um, each year. Um, when I say we do, we will next year. We open in May next year. So at the moment, all we're really trying to play with is the festival and, and plan for exhibitions going forward. But the way that we're planning each of those exhibition um, frameworks is informed by a futures framework. So as Veronique said, I'm a, I'm a futurist. My PhD is in engineering. So I'm really bringing both those disciplines of how we think about the future and how we design processes to come up with something new. So firstly, the content is at the edge of knowledge. It's about research. What are our researchers in the University of South Australia exploring that's interesting? What are researchers around the world doing that's interesting? And, and why is that interesting? Because it's what we, are, what we are asking questions about which will inform the future. And so we want to bring that into the, into the space. The second thing is I want to give young people agency, pathways and a positive image of the future um, because we know that at that age what most young people are asking is how do I navigate my future? How do I make sense of the world? What am I going to do and, and what, what's it going to look like? Um, and if we're going to give young people hope, um, I've just referenced hope theory in those three things. So we want them to be able to leave the exhibition going, wow, there's lots of different ways of coming at this. We want them to be positive about where the future is headed. And we want them to be able to take on tips that transform the way that they behave. So as an example, in one of our exhibitions, we're looking at the body-mind interface and how it relates to pain based on some work that some of our researchers are doing with visual tricks and illusions to fool the body into rethinking chronic pain. 
The research is really interesting. But what we can do with that is then say to young people who are facing exams, if you're feeling pain, there may be several reasons for it, and here are some techniques you can now use to avoid um, falling into chronic pain traps for the rest of your life. So there's something very concrete that comes out of their interaction with that exhibition. We're also using scenario thinking as a basis for exploration. So I'm often asked, you're building a science centre, and people look at the science centres that were opened in sort of 1988 to 1992. Um, I think back to that time, a Walkman was amazing, 20 whole songs in your pocket, the internet was just coming on board, and a lot of the, a lot of the promise of technology was really, really exciting. I think we're in more complex times now when it comes to science communication. Um, so I need a more complex space. And the best way I know how to deal with complex spaces as a futurist is to look at scenarios. What happens if the world looks like this? What happens if it looks like this? And then let's explore it. Um, the best analogy I have for that is actually multi-user domain video games, where you're world building and you're going in and you're exploring a different world. And so we're thinking about the creation of MOD as a giant video game. Um, and each three to four months, there'll be a new topic that you come in and explore. Um, so you might explore, one of our exhibitions is on ecologies and anarchies, complex systems when they thrive and when they fail. So you might come in and explore that topic through seven different gallery spaces um, that give you a, a, a different understanding of, of what that means. Um, the other thing that we're doing around video games is rethinking the types of personas that you might have in a museum. So typically you might play with personas like an explorer, somebody who wants to find out a lot of information and sort of move through the whole space. Or you might have a recharger who just sort of comes in because it's um, you know, a space to relax and to be inspired. But if we're looking at video games, we'll also have socialisers. So we'll have young people who come to our cafe and probably don't go past it. They just hang out. And that's OK. I want it to be a place to be as well as to be inspired. I don't mind if they come and they're inspired by the place enough to stay. And if they want to come every afternoon after school just to go to the cafe, that's OK too. Because I think being in that space allows them to try and make connections, even if they don't explore all the exhibitions. And we're also designing for another video game persona, which is the killer. Um, you know, so we know that people will come into a, a game and try and make things miserable for each other, or to try and break things. So how do we translate that to a museum space in a way that is really creative? So we're designing things that break in interesting ways if you push them. Um, or we're designing places where you can sort of compete against a machine so that you're not affecting other people's, other people's experience. And the other thing, I guess, around that, that concept of scenarios is we're putting people in them. So Amanda referenced co-creation and how you work with young people to create this. We, we're about to appoint a youth advisory board, but we also have a design group of about 50 young people we've been working with on thinking through some of these issues. Um, and the, the next thing they'll be doing is a um, design studio in September, which is designed to um, start to play with machine making. Our second exhibition in October next year will be called Waging Peace. And that asks the question, is it possible to build a peace machine? So it's a way of playing with technologies that often come out of military um, research or come out of um, conflict situations and ask some really pointy questions around, is conflict necessary for peace? How do we aggressively pursue peace? And how do we use technology to do that? So the first step of that is to get our design studio to play with the idea of machine making. Then at the beginning of next year, we'll be calling for designs for peace machines. And then we'll be working with our engineering, our industrial design, and our arts and visual arts or visual design students to make those peace machines. So their work is actually in the space. We're also launching that with a thousand student choir. Um, I said to Amanda, my team currently hates me for that idea. Um, so they'll be performing in the space. And we'll also be calling for works of short fiction, poetry, illustra illustration and photography on that theme and publishing that in an anthology. So you can see participation is really, really rich. Um, we're really wanting um, that group of young people that sit within our state to feel like this is a place they can keep coming to. Um, and at least three times a year there's something different. And they feel compelled to come because their work is in it. Their ideas are in it. They are part of it. Um, I mentioned at the start we are a futuristic museum of discovery. Um, that's not my word. Um, futuristic to me, even as a futurist, sounds a bit science fiction-y. It's the word that 15 to 16 year olds use when I ask them how they would describe it. Well, the so future the is also reaching, connecting through a distance. And I'd like to uh, say hello to all the people watching us through YouTube as well. 
And my first question to you, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt, but we no, have no, 10 that's, minutes that's, to that discuss. My, that was my final um, point anyway, uh, just it's around, that it's around listening to the people that you're working with. Right, yeah. and this brings my first question. Why do you feel that you need to draw the attention of young people physically to bring them over to your museum and your festival in order to have the same effect, the same uh, impact in, in, in teaching them or interesting them in science? Yeah, I, I would say for us, lots and lots of effort being put into driving a STEM agenda to get people to take up those careers. Yes. Um, there is a lot of work done for other age groups. Um, there is a lot of stuff online already that those teenagers can access, um, and yet we're not seeing uptake on those careers. So we have to do something differently. We can't expect that doing the same thing again and again is going to make a difference. So for us it's around, okay, if all of those other resources look like the way they do, how do we do something that's different? And in this case, it's around repeat visits to a place where they feel like they, they it have It sounds to like you're on a fast pace of constantly changing and adapting. Amanda, you mentioned that even what you're setting up right now will be changing in a year from now. So yeah, how do you... Absolutely. I mean, I think... Um, Science is a constantly moving frontier. You, Kristen, is talking about the mod looking at these ideas on the edge. It's the, the motto of TED, the sort of exploring these, these new concepts. Um, coming back to the, the question you asked Kristen, I think um, there's a value to live experiences that um, I think for me as a festival organizer um, is very important. And I think many people in the room here um, probably deliver uh, live events. We do work with technology. It's both a tool and a topic for us in many ways. I referenced a, an exhibition on play. Um, we don't do a huge amount out with a festival in April at the moment, but we know we need to if we're going to build audiences and loyalty and community and to be getting our message across year round. And we know we need to embrace technology more to do that, but we certainly see it operating in parallel to and hand in hand with live event experiences um, because this creation of immersive emotive experiences as I say to me is one way of really trying to move um, people's attitudes in the first instance behavior maybe um, talking to some of our colleagues and, and co-presenters behind the scenes earlier this morning we talked about um, how Don't that's the a bunch. golden yeah the kind of the, that's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that everybody aims for um, it's a lot harder to achieve and it's a lot harder to monitor but that's going to be off topic right for those of you i'm going to just insert this uh, for those of you who want to go on wi-fi to uh, tweet about this session, this, uh, this event, you can um, log in, you can go on your page 8, la page 8 de votre programme. You can visit page 8 of your uh, agenda. This will give you the uh, Wi-Fi address so that you can tweet these interesting developments. Amanda, is there a limit to uh, the number of children that you can actually attract? I mean, there's a certain portion of children that will never it seems be interested in science. Is this something, is this a goal for you to reach all children? I'm not sure about all children, um, but w w the reason we're focused on that 15 to 22 year old age group is we know at 15 that it sort of becomes an identity about people who like science and people who don't. Um, and I notice in, in, my, in my acquaintances and colleagues, I'll have friends who say, oh, I think I'll take up French. Um, I might start and learn the guitar. And only one person in hundreds and hundreds of talks that I've done has ever said, I've just taken an advanced maths class for, as a hobby. And imagine, imagine if that became the norm. So as easy as, you know, you might go back to taking up guitar or French or maths. Um, and I'm really keen to make sure that you don't have to be doing science and be engaged in science as a career to still enjoy science and ideas around science as a cultural experience. And so when we're talking about that broad audience, I'm as... I'm, I think a lot of science talks to the people who love science, and I'm really interested in, in mostly talking to the people who wouldn't say that they love science, but give them experiences where science is embedded. It's a little bit like the science by stealth, mm -hmm. but, but quite deliberately um, making science part of culture. Yeah, I think it, for me, comes back to this idea of the stigma of science. Um, I use an example, right. if you were to stop 100 people in the street and ask them, are you interested in science, then many of them would say no. But if you ask them, are you interested in climate or environment or medicine or healthcare or technology, they probably say yes. So I'm very optimistic about the idea that the right sort of message delivered through the right medium in the right way to the right people will find a point of interest for everybody. Right. 
Um, I had a very interesting conversation recently with a, a, a female chemist who's very active in the Women in STEM um, sort of initiatives and, and agenda. And she was on Women's Hour today on the, on the BBC, talking about Women in STEM, I believe. Um, and we were questioning um, the effectiveness and the value of a Women in STEM um, video campaign we'd seen um, created by a, 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 actually a sponsor of ours um, called Pretty Curious. Um, and it started with this, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty curious. Now this led to quite intense debate um, <laughs> as to whether this was patronizing, whether this was the right approach, some very varied views. And Polly, the, the, the person in question, said, maybe we've got this wrong. We've always taken this kind of tank girl style approach that um, we remove anything that we think is gender specific or catering to special audiences from some of our approaches. But maybe that's wrong. Maybe there are audiences that are attracted to this. They've shown me some pretty decent evaluation data showing some effective results from this campaign. So I, I don't know. I think, yeah, it's about, as I say, the, the right information in the right way. I feel like asking you maybe a bit of a cheeky question <laughs> because you both talked about co-creative approach you know, as a new frontier of reaching out to children. So involving them in solutions and making them feel that they're, they're, they may actually hold the key to a drought and to climate change. And do you uh, get, uh, well, you haven't started yet, but I'm sure you've done focus groups and you think about this. Do you get sometimes such good ideas that could, they could be uh, protected intellectually? that could become actually patented. Ch do children bring out some ideas that are so strong and so good that... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's... So I, we've not had any, but I have to say we've not been focused on um, actually talking about the science with our audience. What we're talking about is the experience with our audience, so it's a slightly different thing. We're, getting, we're, we're asking our teenagers and our, our you know, university students to say, what would you like the experience to look like and what sort of issues would you like to explore rather than doing science with them. Uh, um, and then we're taking those ideas. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting. I, th I mean, I think the other, the other thing to keep in mind about that is um, we're in a bit of a, um, oh, certainly in Australia, we're, we're in a time at the moment where the expert is kind of seen as the enemy. You know, and, and so there can be, I think in, um, co-creating a lot of things or listening to lots of voices, there's, we also muddle which voice is the right one to listen to. And I think it's a really interesting balance of, of making sure that you are pulling in diverse voices, but also going back to something that has authority and expertise and evidence base beside, beside it. So that's, that, I can't answer the first question because we just, we're, we're, we're taking a slightly different approach. It's not on the content, it's, it's, on, the, it's on the process. And for me, I think it raises a couple of interesting points. I think sometimes it's not about coming up with the right answer, it's about asking the right questions and I think young people definitely can do that and can bring a new angle and a new perspective to things to sort of um, to make us put a new hat on and try and see things from a, from a new perspective. That said, one of the programs I, projects I referenced, the Fuse Lab project, we, we asked people to come up, young people to come up with their solutions, these off-world solutions, um, they included them having to come up with brands and do some market research and then pitch these concepts back to an audience of their peers and to experts. And one of the ideas that they came up with, the, the brand, um, if this was ever to take off, they should have patented the logo. They wanted to, their idea was the recycling of human excrement. They had a, they, did, they worked with a graphic designer, came up with a brilliant logo for human your, <laughs> human manure. Um, their logo is excellent. Um, yeah, if that ever becomes a business proposition, then I think they should, um, they should definitely demand some royalties. Uh, I think that's one of, one of the things we're trying to do with Waging Peace in, call, in calling for those designs is to say, look, some of those designs might be, you know, clearly really imaginative and not grounded in reality. Um, some of them might be, though. And, and there is that, um, you know, I have a, a colleague in the UAE who a couple of years ago did a Drones for Good challenge. Um, and, I, and I'm really hoping that we get some really good, solid, imaginative ideas that we could then link with, with researchers to create something but, of value. Oh, that could be another way of attracting children. Yeah. On that note, I'd like to thank you both, thank you. Amanda and Kristen. I'm going to walk you to the thank door you. while I'm inviting our next two guests. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So from the, the safe, 
place of museums and festivals, I'd like now to take you to extreme fields where some scientists actually take the task to communicate with the public and they think it's important, they think it's, a, it's an important part of their jobs. And my first guest is Leslie Elliott. She's the manager of communica communications for the Ocean Networks Canada, the biggest network of the sort in Canada. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here in Montreal on its 375th anniversary, understand? And to think back when ocean explorers were setting out across the surface of the ocean to find new lands and riches and hopefully not fall off the edge. And here we are 375 years later and we still know very little about the sea beneath the surface. In fact, they estimate we know less than 5% about the vast and extreme place on the planet. Ships disappear, planes. We all know the ocean is critical to life on Earth. It gives us the air we breathe, the food we eat. It helps us transport goods and services around the planet. And it may hold the secret to how life began on this planet. We need to better understand it. We need to get more information, more data, we need to have a presence there 24-7 over long periods of time, decades, to understand the changes in the ocean and what that means to us. But it is an extreme and challenging environment. Much like space, but more difficult because of salt water, corrosion, extreme pressures. But we are finding a new way to know the ocean using internet-connected ocean observatories. I'd like to talk to you about WALL-E that hopefully will help you understand how ocean observatories work. WALL-E, named after the, the movie character, is an internet-operated crawler. It's connected to an observatory uh, at Barclay Canyon, which is off of the west coast of Canada, where there's a large outcropping of gas hydrates. Wally is at 900 meters depth and he's on a powered internet connected tether 70 meters long and a German scientist sitting in the comfort of his living room 8.5 kilometers away wakes up, drives him around, turns on his webcam, uh, collects data on multiple sensors and collaborates with other scientists to understand this vast, research, vast resource on the ocean floor. It's estimated that there's more energy trapped in methane hydrates than in all the world's oil, coal, and gas put together. We need to understand it. We need to understand how it's changing as the ocean changes and events such as earthquakes occur. And scientists collaboratively are doing this online. I'd like to talk about another extreme environment where the observatories are connected 300 kilometers off the coast of uh, Vancouver Island, 2.2 kilometers down where tectonic plates are spreading and hydrothermal vents are spewing toxic chemicals into the ocean. It's 350 degrees, it's hot, it's toxic, it's, it's extreme. And we have uh, connected there real time with these fiber optic cables and we have cameras that scientists from all over the world, an instrument developed there in France, watches life which we just discovered in the 70s, actually lives in these deep, dark environments and lives uh, without oxygen. So another extreme environment where we're there 24-7, all the data is online, free, and scientists can work together to better understand how these impo impact ocean circulation and other things in the ocean and us. Why is it important to engage the public? What tools do we use? And how do we do it? What does it mean for citizens and researchers? If the public understand the importance of the ocean and discovery and have opportunities to participate and contribute in a meaningful way, they will support continued funding. They will fall in love with it. And they will take action. With the data from these observatories coming in at a rate of 280 gigabytes a day, 
including well over 100,000 hours of video, we have a big data challenge for scientists. At the same time, this provides an incredible opportunity for the public to be involved and support research. So along with live cameras on, cameras on the observatories, when we go to sea, we collect video with the robots on the ROV. So this vast uh, archive of video is put into what we call a C-tube platform. You can check it out on Ocean Networks Canada. You can go on there and look at video clips in increments of 15 seconds at a time. Um, this allows anyone in the world to search the video and um, I have a story to tell about a 14-year-old from the Ukraine who was watching a live camera one day, an ocean biologist enthusiast. He saw something on the live camera and it was a elephant seal that swooped down to 900 meters and slurped up a hagfish. Well, scientists had never seen this before. He alerted us to this. Uh, he built a YouTube channel on the ocean, and it, it just shows there's a lot of contributions that the citizens and the public can, can provide. Another interactive tool that's been developed is called Digital Fishers, and when we combine it with social media campaigns, um, Ocean Networks Canada was able to crowdsource more than 500 citizen scientists to count fish off the coast of uh, BC. The study concluded that it was not only possible to put citizen scientists to work, but their counts were more accurate than the computer algorithms so far. So every summer, what we do is we go to sea to maintain these observatories. We use ships and robots that are tethered to the ship that go to the depths of 2.6 kilometers. Many of them can go to 6 kilometers and we bring the world with us. Someone asked me from the, the group that I'm working with, well, you've been, have you been there? Of course not. But we don't need to get in a suit and go there. We can bring you there. And we said, well, how do you plug it in? How do you plug all, this, all, these, all these instruments into this network? Well, we use robots. And I'd like to uh, talk to you a little bit about how complicated that is, but how, how we've connected more than 9,000 sensors in this way, from Vancouver to Prince Rupert in, and in, Arctic, in the Arctic at Cambridge Bay Nunavut. If you can picture a ship on the surface with robots, and, and this technology you can imagine is fun, developing robots that can go off the ship down to 2.6 kilometers, plug in instruments, unplug them, move them around, and all the while we're streaming this live on the internet. Scientists are sitting in the comfort of the living room directing new installations, samples, pick up that rock, get a bit of that, get some sediment there. Um, technicians are helping us solve problems through Skype, through social media, and through the, le the live feed. And we also take questions. In June, we'll be out at sea taking questions, and we answer them live. So the public can hear the scientists, the engineers, the technicians in the control room doing this work. They can explore with us, see some species firsthand as we discover them. And it's quite, an, quite a journey. Join us in June. I hope I've provided some hope and inspiration to imagine what can be done to hashtag know the ocean, inspire the next generation and the public to produce action to protect the ocean over the next 375 years and beyond. Thank you. Merci, Leslie. Alors, Leslie reste avec nous et j'en profite maintenant pour inviter. Leslie, please stay with us. And I'd like to invite now one of his collaborators, one of the researchers that we know very well uh, here in Quebec. He knows in the communication of science in extreme milieus, environments. This is uh, Philippe Archambault. He is professor at Laval University. He's also a contributor on radio stations, TV stations, and he often is invited to discuss uh, situations uh, in the north, where we're in uh, the Antarctic. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Leslie, for this excellent introduction. So uh, again, Leslie has mentioned that in 
uh, 19% of the bottom of the sea has not been explored. So even though I don't have any slides, please use, use your imaginations. I'm going to uh, uh, make you imagine the Antarctica. Uh, I have been there. So why is communication through the social media so important for researchers and why should researchers use it more? Uh, and also within this context, how to better communicate to the audience, to the sponsors, and to the media, the results of our research. So I'd like to bring you right away through your imagination to Antarctica, but please start in oh, Australia. You have a 120 meters icebreaker in front of us. This is the Russian, uh, Russian uh, ship, and uh, I don't speak Russian. You go on board, and now we're going to the Antarctica. Five days of travel uh, in on the sea to the south. So I don't want you to be seasick, but going to move a little bit. So imagine five days long travel. You are a scientist, you're doing your testing. Unfortunately, you are in the Antarctica. There are lots of currents. This is one of the sea areas which is very, very agitated for more than 24 hours. You cannot work, not do your uh, research, but you can use the social media during that period of time, you have 10 or 15 meters waves during 24 hours. But I don't want you to be seasick. So now uh, you send little tweets. You can send messages and tweets. So Expedition Ace, two Canadians going to uh, the South Pole. It sent Ace project. The objective is to study the climatic change in the Antarctica. And then you send it. And you continue like this. Uh, project from Philippe Archambault. What is the objective to study uh, to study the uh, situation on board uh, in this ship? So you can then uh, answer to questions. You can connect to uh, you can uh, connect to students, and so you can back uh, you can answer back. And then this is an educational project. So this uh, travel of uh, in this glacier, which is very, very extended. So you want to study uh, th what happens, uh, what's the impact uh, on the Antarctica fauna. So why are we all traveling on the sea? You get many tweets from social media, and this has been distributed. And so a few journalists also want to send you messages. Is it possible? to uh, have a live interview when you're going to use your submarine uh, to go under the sea, 900 uh, meters deep under the ice, when you're talking about an extreme environment. So now we traveled for five days southbound. We had to stick to a glacier. The wind, w wind was 130 kilometers uh, uh, an hour, and we had to wait the end of the wind in order to be able to use our submarine. I stayed uh, on the ship. I was not going that deep. But just imagine how extreme this is. The uh, uh, nearest uh, human is at many kilometers from us, the distance from Montreal to Winnipeg, uh, uh, more than 1,000 kilometers. Over there, they have a French base. They don't have big ships. Why? I will tell you soon. But in the meantime, I am receiving uh, messages. And one journalist asks me, can we do a live interview this afternoon? And then we can do the pre interview this morning at around 10 o'clock. Good. Uh, 10 o'clock for me. 10 o'clock for them in the morning. So we want to do the interview. And I want to uh, use the Iridium uh, phone for the pre-interview for the live during the afternoon. Hello, Mr. Archambault, what's the objective of your exp expedition? The objective is quite simple. We want to dive under the sea. Sorry, sorry. The ship just turned, and the antenna was not in communication anymore with the satellite. We lost the communication. We had to dial back, dial back right away. And finally, I explain we're going to dive with this robot submarine at 900 meters deep in order to study the underwater fauna and to study the importance of this glacier, which corresponds to 25% of the water uh, that uh, provides the deep currents. And so this uh, breakage of the ice breaker, uh, four kilometers long, has destroyed Apollonia, which is an area uh, of ice where there are lots of life. This is like 
uh, South Pole Oasis. So this allows us to study uh, the ice all the time. This is why the small ship that uh, is there in this French base cannot come and help us. It cannot navigate in that type of icy waters. You are still with me on the boat, on the ship. There's ice all around us. We uh, go deep thanks to the submarine and we gather data. All that time we can send communications. I still don't have any results as a scientist. I've just traveled uh, 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 many days. I've been seasick and vomited, but I was able to uh, communicate with many people in order to educate, in order to share the importance of our research in the Antarctica. I was also been able. I have also been able to attract journalists to our work. I don't have results yet. I haven't discovered a cancer remedy. I've just communicated science so far, and this even goes further. I can say, this project was funded by the uh, Ancirc, by the Ancirc, by the. Uh, institute so so and such so this way i can value not only my research but i can also uh, present our funders sponsors that allow us to do this type of research so uh, we're not going to uh, remain in antarctica let's continue our travel in our imagination there's education communication and many levels once the submarine submarine uh, comes out now we have images visuals that we can share we had communications and visuals so all of this later we finally did the interview not live but uh, it was uh, with 12 hours uh, of uh, 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 delay so this is an extreme milieu we have uh, sun 24 hours a day in the Antarctica during this period of the year, and everything was fine. So we do the interview, everything goes fine, it's broadcast. I still don't have any result, but my research has been broadcast, and slowly we have been able to communicate our work in the Antarctica. Here's my message. What's important is I believe that researchers for a long time, we have been very good writing papers, uh, remaining in our silos far away from the population but now it's important it's not now only a matter of choice but now it has it has become a task lots of our research is funded we need to communicate to the audience what are we doing in terms of research that's and one way one way is through the social media that it's possible thank you no, that's fine so i think you made a really strong case that yes communication science communication is super important so much so that you're going through great length to communicate in extreme environments where it doesn't always work out for you, right? You get cut out, where you don't actually have results. My first question to you is, is there a danger of misunderstanding the science for the public? You know, when they see these pictures, misunderstanding what it means, what it's about, uh, when you talk about citizen science, having citizens collect the data, is there a danger that they collect the wrong, you know, the, that they don't collect the right data? If you allow me to answer, I'm also involved in the project that Leslie described previously. We always have to validate the data. Scientists get data from the public. The public helps to watch thousands of hours of video. The videos that we shot in Antarctica are viewed by people who enjoy watching these videos and sometimes will share with scientists elements that have been overlooked. But we always have to validate data that's um, provided by the public. It's important to engage the public and that you get sometimes even uh, from the public answers, you know, some, some people provide answers to what they, they say. So it's a way of engaging the Absolutely. public. Absolutely. And, and it's a vast place. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, just legwork collecting data, right? I mean, uh, the Fukushima example was a good one, but um, another project we do is we, it's called Community Fishers, where people are going out fishing every day in an area where we would like to collect data. And they're quite capable of lowering these instruments, bringing them up, 
they get up, the data gets uploaded to an app, and then the scientists have that area that's currently a gap of data, and they have that. So I think there's lots of opportunities to, to engage the public and even collecting data. Um, when they're counting fish, they're saying, is there a fish, you know? Is there, isn't there? That's the, the type of volume we have. So I think, uh, I just ha had a session with teachers and students and, and the teachers say, the students think science is so hard and it's so inaccessible and I think we need to break that barrier, that there's ways people can get in involved and it's not so, so scary. I mean, I've been to sea collecting samples and it, the, some of that they can be involved in and it makes it exciting to be participating. Yeah, and, and one, one guy that's a, really done a great job at doing this, at drawing the public in, was Chris Adfield, right? And so we, we think of him like the, he, you know, he was able to reach the public from, from space. Why is it still so hard from the oceans and from the, the poles to get the proper connection and be able to do lives? I mean, you do, but it's, it's not always easy. The boat moves. And so why are we more advanced, it seems, in space than yeah, on, on money. Earth? <laughs> money? Money. I think, I mean, another thing I learned from the teachers is the next generation technology is not, it's not surprising them. What, what's possible is what we dream and what we put, to, you know, what we invest in. And, and I think connecting from the sea, from my example, is, uh, is challenging. But we are overcoming the challenges um, as we practice, and the public is willing, as long as we communicate using social media, to stay with us, and we give them nuggets to keep them along when the weather changes or the satellites off. There's a lot to talk about when we're out there. Like you say, they're interested in what's it like at sea. So if we're not actually seeing things in the moment, talk about what it's like life at sea. You know, we work 24/7, 12 hour shifts. It's hard work. It's exciting work. Um, conveying that, I think, just energizes the public to want more. Is Mario Pinto still in the room? Is Mario Pinto still with us uh, since we're speaking about uh, money? Well, if I could add to what Leslie said, money is an issue, but astronauts uh, that go to space first practice in pools in extreme environments, and communication underwater is more difficult than airwave communication. Therefore, communication in the water is hard. We cannot have a GPS that works underwater. The signals are blocked. It is still very hard to explore underwater. We're still under the impression that we've explored all the corners of the Earth, and we're ready to explore the rest of space. I believe that the challenges of communication including communication online, shows that we haven't explored uh, our planet. If I use the analogy of a home, we, it would be like if we owned a home, but we had never visited the basement of our own house. Would you ever purchase a home without visiting the basement? Therefore, I think that we still have a lot of technical issues in exploring the underwater world. For foresee in the next future that would help you uh, map the, the bottom of the oceans better and to also reach the poles better, communicate from there. What do we need? Do we need uh, high, higher tech uh, satellites and uh, do we need another generation of satellites and stabilizers and... Definitivement, c'est y a une très grande avantage. Yes. There's a benefit of working uh, above uh, water. For underwater exploration, we need special ships. We have new uh, self-guided submarines that could help us cover long distances to uh, do mapping work. And when uh, these uh, submarines uh, recharge, they can uh, download the data which would allow us to rapidly increase uh, the quantity of data we can collect and cover larger surfaces. Technologies, yeah. what to look forward to, uh, what uh, the military is quite advanced, why don't they share? <laughs> 
Well, uh, the military were the first, right, to mm. explore the ocean to, for tactics and, and various. And, and in the U.S., well, we use mostly U.S. research vessels. So research vessels for Canada, a, a, a country with the longest coastline in the world, is something Canada should be investing in. It is, a, it is an important. I mean, the Coast Guard it will be expanded, I'm sure. But uh, having our own research vessels to go into these environments, um, the, the remotely operated vehicles, I think people, uh, you, know, you know the people who go in the suits and they go down personally, this is not uh, possible, um, but the remotely operated vehicles played a huge role in facilitating. Uh, some of these are made uh, very high tech, specific for science, what they can do, you know, 3,000 kilometers beneath a ship the navigations and all the, the drivers on the ship to do this, it's quite incredible. And I think that technology will continue to develop. Um, yeah, yeah I, you mentioned uh, uh, Russians and uh, <clears throat> think about uh, collaboration in the world of communication. Um, is this something that is working out? Uh, are you able to? It's, it, I suppose it's vital. Huh? You can't just work it's on one solo. Ocean. It's one ocean. It's all yeah. connected. Yeah. It, it, it's hard mean, to do collaboration, but it's critical. Mm. It, huh? The polyomics the, the is even. We have extremely interesting programs uh, in terms of communications. Let me state, for instance, Argos program, where different countries will um, set uh, sensors uh, and devices everywhere on Earth. And each time the device comes back to the surface, surface of the water, it sends information to satellite. It's like a moving weather station that um, follows different ocean currents. And this is an example of cooperation. We need these cooperations to go to extreme areas of Earth there are some regions in Canada where there are ice layers that are more than seven meters thick where icebreakers cannot access. So there are some uh, extreme areas that are unexplored on Earth where cooperation is crucial. It's all over the world. They are coming to use the, the Ocean Networks Canada is not just a facility used by Canadian scientists, so there are huge collaborations across around the world, um, both developing this technology and working with us as we develop it, but also bringing experiments and questions, developing instrumentation to be down in these environments 24-7. All over the world. Well, that's great. Thank you, Liz. Lee Elliott and Philippe Archambault for laying out all the challenges ahead of you and several years of, of um, wonderful communication with the public. Thank you for your dedication and coming to tell us about this. Thank you for having Merci us. Beaucoup. Thank you. <laughs> so if, um, if digital communication and technologies allow now to communicate like we've never done before. It also has a dark side. It allows to, for badly intentioned people and groups, organizations, to misinform and manipulate the public using scientific information. Who could think that science is the object of a war? Why and by whom? Our next two guests dedicate their lives to highlight the enemies of science and the enemies of the public, ultimately. First, please welcome Sean Otto, the author of The War on Science. Please welcome, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, very early on, in 1789, Thomas Jefferson wrote a friend that wherever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. But what happens now, some 240 years later, when we are inundated with advanced science and technology, when huge science issues 
are affecting our public policy, not just on a local or on a state or on a national basis, but on a global basis. You know, back then, you could understand things. The average voter could generally understand things and become well informed. Even a generation ago, you could make a radio at your kitchen counter or kitchen table. But if you take out your cell phone, you notice that there's no Phillips screws on the back side. It's hard to take modern technology apart, and that makes it less accessible. Both the cell phone and Harry Potter's broom are made by people cloistered away wearing long robes and uttering strange incantations. And at that moment that science becomes something that's more mystical, we become more vulnerable to disinformation campaigns. So we see ourselves entering into a new era of alternative facts and fake news where politically contentious science issues, where the evidence is indicating some kind of public policy response, become attacked by fairly sophisticated public information or public relations campaigns. Uh, one example of this uh, is, of course, climate change, which we've heard about uh, endlessly in the news. But it didn't start there. It started actually uh, many years ago with opposition uh, by tobacco companies to what health sciences was saying about smoking. And from that point forward, it moved into opposition to what Rachel Carson was saying about pesticides. Many of these things developed in our immediate post-war era when science was being quickly commercialized and at the same time, fairly soon after that, when the Soviet Union began to become competitors to the United States in science. Uh, in 1949, the Soviets exploded their own atomic bomb, and in 1957, they put Sputnik into space, and that prompted what really became not just a space race, but a science race. Finally, federal investment in scientific research, which, which had been proposed since the end of World War II, was funded. Scientists began to turn inward, and instead of making their cases to wealthy philanthropists and to the general public, they made them to one another in grant proposals through these federal funding agencies. That produced the most dizzying period of scientific advance in human history. But we also perhaps miscalculated a little bit because we stopped reaching out to the public and a communications bond between scientists and the public that made the know-how of doing science more readily accessible began to wither and eventually break. So we have entered a period then when actors who are opposed to the findings of science find opportunity to produce disinformation that confuses the public. This is being taken advantage of, uh, and, and a war on science really is being fought, I contend, by three different fronts. The first is the identity politics front on, on the war on science. And what this happens uh, to produce is journalists who don't believe that there is any such thing as objectivity, which is material to what we're talking about today. In fact, a lot of the problems that we've started seeing happening in communication about objective science and facts happened after the Society of Professional Journalists removed the objectivity requirement from their code of ethics in 1996. Journalists, instead of looking at objective facts and holding the powerful accountable to those facts, sort of wash their hands of the democratic process and view their job more as being fair and balanced. And when a journalist who perhaps doesn't have much knowledge of science, as many political reporters don't, uh, begins reporting on a scientifically contentious political issue, we wind up having something called false balance, where journalists will equate the, uh, a scientist pre prevent, or presenting the knowledge gained from tens of thousands of experiments over perhaps 30 or 40 years done by thousands of scientists, some of whom have died creating this data, 
uh, in one half of the story or one half of the television screen and somebody with an opposing opinion in the other half, creating what we call false balance. What this does in a democratic society is it elevates extreme voices into the public dialogue, creates further division, and amplifies partisanship. It also provides opportunities for the other two fronts in the war on science, the ideological war on science. This has generally been promoted uh, in the, since the late 1980s, somewhere around the same kind of time frame when fundamentalist evangelicals took to television and really began to organize politically. They uh, often are uh, objecting morally and ethically to what science is saying about origins, either origins of the earth or particularly human origins, reproduction, sexuality, gender, etc. They view that as God's territory and the traditional values of that shouldn't be challenged by science and shouldn't be codified in a democratic society. And yet, the whole idea of democracy is predicated on our ideas of evidence. Thomas Jefferson actually drew on the thinking of what he called his trinity of three greatest men, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, and John Locke, when he was crafting the Declaration of Independence. And he essentially synthesized their thinking into the idea that if any man or woman could discover the truth of something for his or herself using the tools of reason and science, then no king, no pope, and no wealthy lord is more entitled to govern than we are ourselves. So there is a conflict emerging between what uh, fundamentalist ideologues feel is their moral and ethical duty and the actual precepts of evidence-based democracy. This is being enabled to a certain extent by a media who views their job as balancing different views. Finally, the third front in the war on science is probably the most troubling, and I mentioned it briefly earlier, uh, which is the industrial war on science. Here we see about uh, $1.2 billion a year being spent by energy industry companies alone on public misinformation campaigns. Uh, including sophisticated public relations campaigns, fronting grassroots astroturf organizations, and doing a number of other things that are all focused on creating uncertainties in the public mind about what the evidence indicates. This is for the strict purpose of forestalling or reversing regulation or legislation that the evidence suggests we should be doing, but they oppose because it affects their business model. So this constellation of three different fronts in the war on science, the postmodernist or uh, identity politics front that uh, argues that there's no such thing as objectivity that has affected our journalism, the ideological front uh, that has uh, argued morally and ethically against science and evidence and public policy, and the industrial front that has worked to create a great deal of uncertainty are coming together at a very sensitive time because we are at a point in human history when scientists and engineers no longer need to be together in one room or one lab or one time zone or one geography to work together. So we're seeing a qualitative difference in what we're able to do over the internet and a quantitative difference in the number of scientists and engineers that are doing it to the point that we're creating knowledge about 10 to 12 times as fast. I'm not just talking about data. Data we're talking about maybe 100 times as fast as we have in the recent past, but knowledge about 10 to 12 times as fast. So we will be creating as much new knowledge in the next 20 to 30 years as we have since the beginning of the scientific revolution. All of that knowledge needs to be codified in our legal system. All of it needs to be morally and ethically parsed and discussed. We need to have public conversations about all of it. And we're in a time when the level and sophistication of that knowledge is exceeding what any one scientist can know, much less what the general public can know. So I argue that we're approaching uh, an existential crisis for our means of making decisions about public policy in democracy, and that we have to find new techniques for bringing this advanced scientific knowledge into our public policy dialogue. That's why I helped organize uh, an initiative called sciencedebate.org uh, with Matthew Chapman, Cheryl Hirschenbaum, and others 
to get the candidates for United States president to debate the big science policy issues that are affecting everyone's lives now. We've done that online for the last three presidential cycles, and I've also spoken to science journalists in several different countries around the world about how to create parliamentary science debates in an effort to begin to at least incorporate this into our political dialogue in a way that combats disinformation. Uh, finally, I also wrote the book, The War on Science, kind of in an effort to reach out on these issues again and helped uh, as one of the many, many organizers behind the recent March for Science. And I think that I'll leave it there, uh, but that gives you kind of an overall perspective on where I'm coming from. Merci, Sean. Thank you. Merci. I believe that sets the table for our next uh, guest, who dedicates her time in identifying fake news, fake scientific information. Her name is uh, Vanessa Cipani. She joined uh, the team of factcheck.org. She also helped the development of uh, scicheck.org. She works on finding and presenting to the public fake news. Uh, please welcome Mrs. Vanessa Cipani. Um, so the main thing that I want to talk about today is um, the strengths and limitations of science as it relates to politics. So uh, Veronique gave you an introduction to what uh, organization I work for, but factcheck.org, I'll just say it again in English. <laughs> Um, it is uh, a nonpartisan, that's the very important point. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit based at the University of Pennsylvania at the Annenberg Public Policy Center. And we spend our time monitoring the claims of U.S. politicians, uh, so only U.S. politicians, but trust me, we have our hands full. Um, and I am their science writer. So factcheck.org has been around since 2003. It was one of the, if not the original, fact-checking organization before it became a fad. Um, but SciCheck was uh, established in 2015. Um, and so I concentrate on scientific claims uh, only. Um, so sometimes fact-checking science can be relatively straightforward. So, if I'm fact-checking a claim, let's say, like, climate change is a hoax, um, that one's pretty easy. <laughs> um, and to be honest, those are the ones that uh, I have a little less fun doing because the science is quite straightforward. Um, but sometimes um, the more fun ones is when the science is really nuanced. Um, so on a few occasions, I've written articles about um, topics where you'll have one side saying, well, science is on our side, and then the other side, who's saying the opposite, is saying, no, science is on our side. So I'll act as a, somewhat of a, a mediator between those two sides, and I'll look at what the science actually says. Um, so I can give you one example, one article that I wrote recently. It was about a pesticide called, an insecticide called chloropyrifos. Um, and the debate as to whether or not to ban it completely in the United States hinged on whether or not it affected the development of children. I mean, it certainly has other effects, but that, when you look at the documents, that's really what, um, whether or not to or not to, to ban it, that's what it de uh, depended on. So um, I looked at the science. T to set it up, though, I can say that um, the Obama administration, so Obama's EPA, looked at the evidence over a number of years and said, okay, the science has limitations, but we think we have sufficient evidence to say that uh, a complete ban on the product is, is reasonable. So um, then on the other side, we've got uh, the Trump administration's EPA, which is headed by Scott Pruitt, uh, who you may know. Um, and he looked at the science and he made it a, a different uh, analysis of the science. He said, the science is limited, so we're not going to ban it because we don't know yet. So on the one side, both are admitting that the science is limited, but one is following what you would maybe call the precautionary principle, and the other is saying, well, we don't want to put a drain on our economy, which was Pruitt's uh, argument, um, so we're not going to ban it. So I looked at the science. and. Um, 
There was definitely research that suggested that uh, chloropyrifos affected the development of children, but a lot of those studies had smaller sample sizes. So when you're talking about epidemiology, you want a sample size of thousands. That makes, that makes uh, a science journalist, when you read that, feel quite confident. But a lot of these studies had 300 or under. Um, so I'm not saying that that's not representative, but it still is not quite as strong as, say, a study of 1,000. Another thing to point out is epide epidemiological studies are correlational, not causative. Um, so, and that's very difficult. So you're not uh, often, you know, there are laws against testing certain uh, chemicals on humans. So it's very difficult to um, get that causative information. But you do have causative studies that looked at, at animals. Um, so the studies are there, but there are limitations. Um, and then on the other hand, there was also another study that I talked about with Veronique that um, was based in Canada, not in the United States, that actually did not find a correlational link between chloropyrifos and um, development of children. So based on all of that, Obama's EPA says, we're going to ban it, that's enough. Pruitt's EPA or Trump's EPA says, no, we're not. So when I looked at that article, we're nonpartisan, so we don't make a judgment on this is the right policy or this is the wrong policy. So I said, here's the evidence, and I left it up to my audience who reads uh, factcheck.org to, to make that judgment on their own. And that's something I hope we can talk about a bit, is the responsibility of the public in, in um, retrieving accurate information. Um, so, you know, we live in a digital age. And uh, factcheck.org is only a internet-based uh, organization, so we don't have any print copies. So, um, you know, my view of the internet <laughs> is, is that it brought with it, it's not all negative, and I don't think anyone here would really think that, but it brought with it more information. And when you have more information, you have more good information and you have more bad information, um, or, or inaccurate information. Um, so. At Fact Check, we try and combat that information that um, gets spread across the internet, maybe at sites called Natural News or foodbabe.com, um, you know, that, that spread these claims that really should have died a long time ago. Um, so one question that we get over and over again is people will email factcheck.org and say, I read on this article on naturalnews.com or some other site, that vaccines aren't safe and they cause autism. Is it true? And we still, on a weekly basis, get those questions. So, um, you know, it doesn't help to that, you know, with Twitter, uh, for example, at, at the moment we have a president that, that has insinuated, um, more than insinuated, that vaccines uh, are related to the cause of autism. Um, so what we try to do is we try to, uh, we answer those questions actually directly. So we have a new feature called Ask SciCheck where you can email us your questions. You say, okay, I read this one article on this one site, I'm not sure if it's accurate, and we'll actually directly answer them for you. Um, and you know, it turns out when we looked at the rise in autism and in the United States, it turns out that it has nothing to do with vaccines. <laughs> And um, really what it comes down to is, scientists think, is that the definition of autism has broadened. So that means that there's going to be more people that are diagnosed with it. There's also more awareness of the disorder, of autism spectrum disorder. So that means that when there's more awareness, more people will be diagnosed. Um, there's also, uh, some researchers have looked at trends in how instead of uh, diagnosing a child with a different kind of developmental disorder because there's so much awareness of uh, autism, now they're diagnosing them with autism. So you put that all together and you see an epidemic when in reality it's very unclear as to whether or not there are actually more people with the disorder. Um, so I'll just belabor the point that our main goal is to balance out as much as we can all the false information that's being spread on the internet with accurate information. And we've actually uh, partnered with Facebook to do that directly. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys have seen this feature, but what can happen is uh, 
fact-checking organizations, so us and PolitiFact and Washington Post, will tag an article that is completely wrong, what you would call maybe today fake news, and it would say on Facebook, disputed by factcheck.org or disputed by PolitiFact, and then there would be a link where you can click on it and you can get the accurate information. Um, and Facebook also has other initiatives, but that's our, that's our partnership. But I'd like to make one comment about fake news. I actually think that the term is misleading itself, um, at least with science. So there are definitely fake news articles that really have no morsel of truth to them. I, we don't even know where they come from sometimes. But with science often, it's based on a certain, there's a morsel of truth to it. Or it's a misunderstanding. So I prefer the term viral deception, which is a, a, a term that uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson, she's the director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center, she came up with. And it's really more accurate because it's really what we're talking about is deception. And really the main problem here is that it's viral. Um, so I prefer that term. I don't know if it'll catch on, but I think that term makes a lot more sense. Um, another thing that I really hope that Sean and I can talk about is just this idea that science, is, has, science has strengths, but it also has limitations. And it's, science doesn't provide 100% proof. Any scientist will tell you that. It, provides, it can provide overwhelming evidence for in the case of vaccines or, or uh, climate change, for example, but it won't, cause, it won't provide proof. So politicians uh, over time have picked up on that limitation of science, that there will always be at least a little bit of uncertainty. Um, and they, they use, at least in my observation of working at factcheck.org, they use that uncertainty to say, well, we're not 100% sure about climate change, so we don't need to act on it. Um, and I, at my job, my main uh, prerogative at Fact Check is really just to say, all right, I'm not gonna say science is a golden ticket to all of our problems. I'm gonna say here's its strengths and here's its limitations, and the public and politicians can decide on the policy. So that's, I'll, I'll conclude on that point. Um, but we're a nonpartisan organization. We like providing information, but we really want to leave it up to you to, to make the decision on what you believe. Thank you very much. So, which brings me to actually the, the last question we had <laughs> talked about when we talked earlier. It, and it's the fact that when people are presented with fact and truth, sometimes they can't, they can't accept it. Like, have you looked at that phenomenon? Like, whether you can, you can tell them, you can show them, if you can fact check a story and tell them, look, this is not it. They still can't see it. It seems like they're attracted to this right. kind of... Well, one problem uh, with that, which is something we talked about earlier, too, is that... Uh, I hope that it's changing, I feel that it's changing, um, that the process of science has not been communicated in, by science journalists very much. And I, I try in my articles to communicate, not this is what scientists found, but this is also how they found it, and this is why it's, it's a valid uh, argument. Um, so I think that perhaps if you can communicate to the public how scientists actually came to a certain conclusion, what is their argument for a certain uh, finding, that might help people instead of just laying a fact on them. You know? Right, to, sh to show the traverse of science, mm -hmm. to show that science doesn't have the answers to everything. Right. In that sense, is it really a war on science or a war on facts, a war on people? Yeah, no, I think that, that that's, I completely support that and, and write about that in the book. Um, and when I, I frequently speak to uh, educators, um, and that's one of the things that I talk about. It's becoming increasingly difficult in the United States because one of the things that politicians love to monkey in is education. And particularly in setting standards and accountability because it makes them look good. Uh, but m the best science education is really an emphasis on curiosity and on process, on breaking it down and showing the how-to. 
uh, rather than what, what the end result is. And so if, to the extent that you can do that, then you're all of a sudden you're telling a narrative. And the narrative is how we figured this out. Mm -hmm. And once you tell a narrative and you show how we figure this out, then people can see it and come to their own conclusions based on that evidence. Um, most people who fall victim to disinformation are also basing their conclusions on evidence. It's just that the pieces of evidence that they're getting are uh, from different sources and from sources often with vested interests. So if science communicators aren't breaking it down and communicating the how-to, we're depriving the public of that knowledge that they need in order to make good decisions in self-governance. Right, and then, uh, you know, I can't help but preach for my own uh, background in science journalism. I think it is key to this. But in an environment where there's digital, where <clears throat> stories travel super fast, and false news travel super fast, is there a way to, to stop a, an engine of falsehood in this environment? I mean, you're part of the, the solution, but it's, there's still tons of other in that sphere that do disinformation. Is there... To stop, I mean, uh, other than shutting down the internet, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think you made a really good point about instilling scientific cur curiosity. So a researcher that we talked about earlier, his name's Dan Cahan, and he's doing research right now that's really enlightening. He looks at uh, what happens when you give people scientific information and what happens, and he also looked at that in parallel to, uh, he tried to quantify scientific curiosity. And really what prevents a person from falling for that false information is not how much information they actually have. So you can throw as many studies about climate change at them, mm -hmm. but it's actually the level of scientific curiosity that they have. Mm -hmm. Um, to figure it out. Well, how are scientists doing this? Mm -hmm. um, That's interesting. I, th point. I think that also another way to, to circle back on that, to help prevent it is, again, for journalists and for the society of professional journalists, there, there's actually kind of a big discussion that's broken out now, again, since uh, the last election, um, that is exploring this question of what is journalistic responsibility in these issues where there is objective knowledge uh, and should they be communicating that and holding politicians accountable to that? Some journalists think that that's a very racy topic uh, because then they're, they're participating uh, as an actor and they think that they lose their, uh, their objectivity as a journalist in that way. Right, it's, but it's also dangerous. I mean, you, may, you might want to share your story on how you came to decide to write War on Science. Oh, well, as I began writing about a lot of these issues, I, you know, I personally, and I know several scientists where this has happened to, too, just was subject to unbelievably vitriolic attacks. And I know several scientists who, you know, frequently get, you know, dead cats or flaming bags of, you know, what, dropped at their door or death threats by uh, electronic communication or in the mail. So there is a very... Um, there's a very concerted effort to intimidate people, uh, certain people anyway, who talk about issues that vested interests don't really want them discussing. Mm. Yeah, so, but I think back to the bigger question of how do we turn this around, I think that there are two, there are two strategies that are important. One is what side check and fact check do, kind of the fact checking of stuff that's already out there. The other is to really help uh, pr promote this discussion of of what is the real appropriate role of journalism when there is a factual knowledge-based bit of evidence um, in a politically contentious discussion. And I think that that's the role where science journalists uh, can play such a critical, important addition to the discussion on our political pages, which is a place that they've traditionally been banned from. But I think that in this day and age, we really need science journalists to have a, a voice in that process. Well, that's uh, something that pleases me to, uh, to hear, of, of course. But can we, hope to, uh, can we hope to work together with the scientists, you know, when the scientists also feel that they're either muzzled or they're not free to talk? Is there a way that we can, uh, that, that's also part of the, the war on science, right? The freedom to, to speak, the freedom to... 
Uh, well, that, I mean, that's, we were talking about that earlier. I mean, that's certainly not the case with university scientists, at least in the United States. Um, on occasion, I will say, though, that I have emailed professors asking for their comment on certain articles, and they make the choice to not comment on it because they don't want to risk losing funding. And I don't know if that's muzzling them. I mean, it seems like they're making that choice on their own to not be outspoken. Um, but when you're talking about muzzling, though, that would certainly happen. I mean, I can never speak directly with EPA scientists, which we talked about. And you said that that was something that was also going on in Canada. Oh, a few years ago. I, well, hopefully now things have changed. <laughs> yeah. But there was a period in Canada where scientists couldn't, government scientists could not talk yeah. directly to uh, to journalists. And they, you know, especially those involved in toxicology. And these, these uh, programs are now starting again. But uh, it's, I mean, it's difficult when you want to convey a message of that could potentially create a health crisis, or you, know, you have to be careful, mm -hmm. of course. So, you know, in your experience, I don't know if you've, if you've looked at that, you've organized the March on Science, and- you've, Why did I help? I was you born. helped organize it, and so you're inviting scientists to speak out and to, um, to tell that to, you know, the public that maybe the government is not going in the right direction in the U.S. right now on, on certain issues. Well, part of the idea of the March for Science, part, well, partly it was, yes, the, the proposed cuts, particularly to major government science agencies, which produce the evidence that the government relies on to make nonpartisan balanced policy decisions. Uh, that also helps inform the public. Um, so it was partly a funding issue, but it was also an issue of a kind of a perceived um, change in our public dialogue where uh, scientists were actually being attacked, as they have been, by certain vested interests, um, particularly mostly in, in various commodities industries, um, where uh, certain evidence is suggesting uh, that regulation is appropriate and businesses don't like that. Um, so I, th I think that the big motivation was not just a, a, a liberal motivation against uh, what the Trump administration was doing. I think it's been really growing for some time. And I should point out that there are those on the left who have their own issues with anti-science, as it's sometimes called. Um, on the left, it tends more to be about unfounded suspicions of hidden dangers to health or the environment. Uh, the things like the idea that cell phones may cause brain cancer or that type of thing uh, that are not supported by the evidence. Uh, and on the right, it tends more to be uh, anti-regulatory or against uh, what science is saying about reproduction or gender or sexuality. Well, one thing that I, it's sort of tangential. Um, you know, when we're talking about science funding, uh, there are definitely certain organizations, or I'm sorry, uh, agencies within the United States that are getting cut. But when I saw, just as a personal anecdote, when I saw Trump saying he was going to cut the NIH budget, um, I didn't, I didn't think that it would pass through Congress. And that's, I'm not, I'm not saying the U.S. political system is perfect, but uh, the fact that I, you know, funding the NIH is a non, or is a bipartisan thing, mm -hmm. and the fact that. Trump proposed that, and then Congress said, no, we're actually going to give them a $2 billion surplus mm -hmm. uh, you know, in extra funding, I think is telling. That there is a limitation on how much the executive branch can do. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I have to stop it yeah. here. I feel we could actually uh, create a whole <laughs> course and continue the discussion. So it's so important. You know, when you're talking about the foundation of a society and democracy and existentialist crisis, it's scary to think that you know, false news and, but then, you know, there's a positive side to, the, to that, the fact that some of us are trying to streamline the message to the public in the right way. And maybe, maybe one of these ways are using humor. So yeah. Yeah. I'd like to <laughs> thank you both for coming on stage and invite our next guest to discuss. Right. <laughs> thank you, Sean. Thank you. Anissa. Yeah, science and uh, our discussions have been pretty serious, uh, but some, some guys, some, they find that science is actually funny. 
And uh, I'd like to invite our next uh, guest. There are two guys who have no background, but they have a fascination and a curiosity for science facts. Alors, j'aimerais inviter tout d'abord Patrick Beau, de qui nous vient d'Avignon. I'd like to welcome uh, first uh, Patrick Beau from Avignon, France. Patrick has launched a YouTube channel that's uh, called Axolot that uh, has uh, thousands of viewers. And we'll hear a few words to understand why it is so popular. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Patrick. And I like to be surprised. My job is uh, to collect uh, interesting things. I started uh, on the radio in the early 2000s. I started a blog in 2009 called Axolot. It then became a book, a YouTube channel in 2013. And finally, a comic book in uh, 2014. Through all of this work, I like to show how our surroundings can be a source of fascination beyond fiction, be it through uh, historical events, through outstanding uh, locations on Earth, or science. I'd like to point out from the onset that I'm not a scientist, but I, I'm a pathological curious guy. I try to share the nuggets I find in the mass of scientific information to share this with people that follow me. And I believe that real scientists, researchers, and specialists don't always know what uh, fragment uh, they should use uh, to attract uh, the attention of the public. Therefore, I believe uh, it's important uh, that people act at um, making science more accessible to lay people. My YouTube channel first was uh, designed for the moon exploration, but since I look at things that are unusual, I decided to focus on the objects that we left behind on the moon. Believe me, there are many things we left behind on the moon. And if you ask uh, people on the street, what do you think you would find on the moon? Most people will say, well, a flag, unless it's a conspiracy uh, theorist who thinks that we never went to the moon. But some people will say, oh, maybe we'll find footprints. But on the moon, there are many things we left behind, including two golf balls that were left there by an astronaut from Apollo 14. Alan Shepard thought, since I'm going to be on the moon, might as well do something that will mark uh, the imagination. I'll do something unusual that will mark the imagination. So he hid two golf balls in his belongings. Once he reached uh, the moon, he uh, made a golf club with the material he had on hand. And he hit two golf balls on the moon that went off very far. It's a lot easier on the moon than on Earth. What's crazy is that there's a video of this. And you could watch this video on YouTube. If you, ta if you type in Alan Shepard moon golf balls, you can see this, and maybe on a more political, uh, poetic note, the last person who went to the moon, Eugene Cernan, left the initials of his daughter on the moon soil that will probably stay there for uh, thousands of years, maybe forever. In a less poetic way, there are a lot of excrements that were left on the moon because uh, that would take up too much space and it's too heavy to bring back in the uh, moon m module. So uh, maybe we'll have to start cleaning up uh, after us, uh, which is a typical human behavior. I also have a book, Terre Secrète, Hidden World, that is dedicated to marvels of the world. But there are hundreds of books that look at the marvels of the world. My objective was to find an unusual angle. Therefore, I looked for the most unknown and incredible sites that exist uh, in the world. In Australia, there's a, a candy pink lake. It seems like a 
milkshake, a strawberry milkshake was uh, poured in the middle of the forest. A lot of people think that it has been photoshopped, but this color comes from the bacteria and algae that we find in the lake. So it's really unbelievable. In Mexico, there's a cavern that is filled with giant crystals. It was discovered by chance by miners that were um, drilling for minerals. And they came uh, by chance on this cavern. They found minerals, uh, crystals that are about 40 tons. Uh, for geeks here, I don't know if you could imagine uh, Superman's uh, fortress and the pictures are astonishing there are pictures from National Geographic uh, of the uh, crystals and the scientists are tiny beside uh, these crystals they wear special suits because the atmospheric uh, conditions in the cavern uh, would not cannot you cannot live in this condition because the humidity is uh, too uh, strong there you, visit, tourists cannot visit this cavern but that's part of these incredible things we can find on earth that go that go beyond fiction astonishment are the hidden mechanisms of mankind we are curious by nature and I try to tap into that feeling through my work. And to conclude, I have two sentences that summarize this idea. The first is from Aristotle, who said that all sciences are born from the astonishment of things the way they are. I think this remains true to this day. We don't take things for granted, and we try to dig a little bit deeper. And another sentence, or another quote, to Isaac Asimov. The uh, most important sentence in science is not Eureka, but rather, hey, that's funny. Well, our next guest is from the US. He's from North Carolina. And he also finds that science is pretty funny. He's actually a comedian. And he became uh, um, so interested in, in science, he thought it was so, that now he is a science communicator as well. Please welcome Brian Mallow. Hello, uh, let me just settle in for a second. I'm a little self-conscious of my posture usually when I first get on stage. And I think it's because my mother used to tell me to stand up straight. Did you ever get that from your mother? Stand up straight. That's such a universal thing. I think mothers have been telling their kids to stand up straight for longer than we realize. Perhaps even to pre-human days. <laughs> what if that were the driving force behind the evolutionary trend to walk erect? Mothers nagging their children up the evolutionary ladder. Yeah. Stand up straight. Don't drag your knuckles when you walk. What are you, born in a tree? <laughs> All right, I'm a comedian, and maybe I should have said that a couple times up front to make it clear. Um, <laughs> it's the best job I've ever had, but it's not the only job I've ever had. I used to be an astronomer, but I got stuck on the day shift, which sucks. You don't discover <laughs> anything good. Overwhelming response to the comedy so far. <laughs> maybe you weren't expecting it, or maybe it's the translation. I'm not really sure. but. Uh, <laughs> Let me all, that's what I'm always going to blame it on. It's the translation. It's, you don't get my sense of humor. Or, or I'm, I'm, I'm talking too fast for the translator, probably. Is that it? Right. So, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I am a comedian. And uh, I, I, I should say that I was lying when I said that I used to be an astronomer. That's what my people call a joke. My people being comedians or Jews, if that's not redundant. Um, <laughs> I'm not a scientist and I'm not a doctor, although I play one in the broken dreams of my parents. <laughs> Thanks, there you laughed, that was not a joke. <laughs> I was opening up to you and you laughed, that's great. So uh, I have always looked at the world though. I did go to a magnet school for bipolar students. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how the French translator can do with a pun. That's always uh, challenging. But uh, I have always looked at the world through kind of a 
uh, a scientific worldview. I, I grew up reading science and science fiction. Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke were big influences, as, as well as George Carlin and Richard Pryor. Uh, but I've always had this sort of science worldview, very rational. Like I noticed a long time ago, whenever my mom would lose weight, my dad would gain weight. And when my dad lost weight, my mom gained weight. It was like the conservation of mass within our family. And I had a theory that you never actually lose weight, you just give it to somebody else. <laughs> Fat can be neither created nor destroyed. It's one of the basic laws of the universe. So uh, I am a comedian, but I also identify, as uh, Veronique said, as a science communicator. And honestly, I don't even think they're that different. Science, I've loved science for longer than I, I, I realized I might go into comedy. And they're not even that different. That quotation from Isaac Asimov, uh, I really resonate with that uh, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not eureka, but that's funny. That's how comedy starts too, an observation, and it's like, what can I do with that? There's something funny, can I learn to communicate that? Like, I see something, can I communicate the idea to everybody else? And I see a lot of connections there. So, um, my path, once I discovered I, I was doing science comedy, that led me to doing other science communication efforts. So I made science videos for Time Magazine, and I've worked with Neil deGrasse Tyson doing pieces for his radio show. And then ultimately I took a job at a science museum, and I worked for four years in science communications. And mostly I hosted talks by scientists, and I interviewed scientists, and I tried to be a bridge between the scientists and the public. Again, much like what Patrick was talking about, um, trying to get this uh, across what's so cool about what they do. I don't feel pressure to always make it funny. And one of my favorite bits of advice has become this story I heard from Richard Feynman, the late great American physicist, Nobel Prize winning physicist. He said that his father used to read to him from the encyclopedia. He would sit him on his lap, I think he was a child at the time, and he'd sit him on his lap, and he would read about dinosaurs, for instance. And when he got to a fact, like, this dinosaur attained a length of so many feet, he would stop and he'd say, you know what that means? That means if this dinosaur was sitting in our front yard and you looked out the window of your second floor bedroom, you would be looking him right in the eye. He took the bare facts and he translated them into what they really mean. And I resonated with that like an analogy I haven't come up with yet. Um, it just really hit me. It's like, I'm not a scientist, but that's, I think that's what I do, whether I'm explaining science or comedy. For instance, uh, the International Space Station orbits the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. And that sounds fast, but it's a number that's so outside our daily experience that I don't think we quite connect with it. What if I told you that's the same as about five miles per second. And that means if you were in space and the International Space Station went by, in one second it would be five miles away. It's the size of a football field. That's what 17,500 miles per hour really doesn't convey at all, right? Or Pangea, right? Today we have seven separate continents, but a couple hundred million years ago, we had one unified landmass called Pangea. Well, that means international travel was really easy. <laughs> Do you want to go to Australia? It's right over here. <laughs> Do you want to go to England? Right over there. Couldn't be easier. And really, my favorite example comes from something I learned working at a science museum. Uh, birds are dinosaurs. How many people know that? Birds are dinosaurs. By applause. Do you know that birds are dinosaurs? <laughs> Let me ask you, how many people did not know that? Birds are dinosaurs. Literally, birds are dinosaurs. Good. Hopefully some, but when I was growing up, I think we heard they were related to dinosaurs or descended from dinosaurs. But today, birds <coughs> are categorized taxonomically as avian theropod dinosaurs. And they are the one group of dinosaurs that survived the mass extinction 65 million years ago. So just like it's not accurate to say that Pluto is a planet anymore, sorry, uh, it's really not accurate to say that dinosaurs are extinct. They are not extinct. There are 10,000 living species of dinosaur. <laughs> they're on every continent, and their diversity is incredible. There are hummingbirds that weigh less than a penny, and ostriches that weigh 300 pounds and stand nine feet tall. Not quite tall enough to peer into your second floor bedroom, but 
I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> and just look what we have. We have penguins and peacocks. We have murmurations of starlings. We have carrion eaters and birds of prey. The bald eagle, the symbol of my country, is a dinosaur. And so is Donald Duck and Tweety Bird <laughs> and the Roadrunner. Corvids, like crows, are clever tool-using dinosaurs. Parrots are talking dinosaurs. Blackbird singing in the dead of night, that's a song about a dinosaur. <laughs> so is Freebird. And I know why the caged dinosaur sings. Here's how not extinct dinosaurs are. Most mornings when I wake up, the first thing I hear is the cries of dinosaurs outside my dwelling. I get up, I have dinosaur eggs for breakfast. I walk out to my car and a dinosaur has desecrated my car. From the looks of it, more than one dinosaur, a whole gaggle of dinosaurs, a parliament of dinosaurs, a murder of dinosaurs has defecated all over my car. Dinosaurs defecating on buildings is such a problem in our modern society that there's a whole industry that makes countermeasures. You know those spiky things? They're called bird spikes or pigeon spikes if you want to single out somebody. On Thanksgiving in America, on, on, on American Thanksgiving, almost every non-vegetarian in the United States has the same dinosaur for dinner. And, and KFCs, you know, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Colonel Sanders built an empire on his recipe for fried dinosaur parts sold by the bucket. So we know what dinosaur tastes like. It tastes like chicken. <laughs> and turkey and duck. And if somebody is a, a kind of a light eater, what do we say? They have a small appetite, right? We go, she eats like a bird. Well, well why did that <laughs> dinosaur become the standard for eating light? <laughs> Photosynthesis, that's eating light. <laughs> All right, maybe not the strongest line to end on, but we're gonna stop right there and uh, okay. thank you very much. Thank you, All right. Wow. So where, where do you both find your ideas? I mean, <laughs> um, you have a Eureka moment when you see yes, something. Yes, so do I speak in English or in oh, French? Do you français. speak in English? <laughs> it will be better in French. All sources are good. It can be books, it can be the internet, it can be documentaries. And the thing is, it's like, you know, gold digging. Sometimes you, you find a gold, golden nugget, and then I, I choose to, to use it in a video, or in a book, or in a comics. And really, uh, it's, it, it's like uh, cherry picking or, or gold digging. And I think if I didn't do what I do, uh, I will do it anyway just for, uh, for passion, just for, you know, getting amazed. Because this is really what I like in life, is being amazed and so. It sounds like there's a huge future for this science communicator humorist, right? I mean, you both live from making jokes or making... But yes, uh, ah, I have you to both... precise that I'm not a humorist at all. Uh, I, I'm just a curious guy yes. who try to uh, convey uh, his amazement, but he's a real comedian. I'm so, trying to be serious and people yeah. just keep laughing at me. <laughs> no, but I think that's a good point and that's part of... Uh, so I do spend a lot of time talking now to scientists and about how to communicate to general audiences. And I do not want to tell scientists to try to be comedians, but I do tell them to try to be themselves. Your best chance of being humorous on stage and your best chance of connecting with an audience is to be relaxed, prepared enough that you're not repeating a, a memorized script. You're in the moment and you're trying to be yourself and you try to reveal some humanity and some personality which scientists are often sort of, that's shunned a little bit, because if you're at a conference communicating your research to your peers, you're not expected to, to inject personality. But if you're talking to other humans, it's a good idea. It sounds like there's, there's, yeah. it sounds like there's a huge untapped territory of communication that hasn't been, you know, communicating science that hasn't been ex exploited yet. With the form of humor and with the form of, 
insolite, euh, yes. approche insolite ou des oui. choses inexpliquées. Le fait que les scientifiques scientists ne savent toujours pas what kind of uh, fact, what bits can get the general public interested in science. And so this is our job. Uh, we, we go through uh, a lot of scientific information and then sometimes we, we find one nugget and we say, okay, this will get everyone interested. And so we simplify the, the, the stuff and I think People who, who do this simplification have an important place in society because there is scientists, there is general public, but we have to to have a medium between between the two. So, mm. yeah, I've had a scientist tell me a lot of scientists are professors and they teach classes and they teach more than just their specialization. And I've heard this this might be called the expert blind spot that in some ways I've had a, a professor tell me that it was easier for him to teach the subjects that he's not the specialist in. Because the, the area he's a specialist in, he knows so much about it, he doesn't know what to leave in and leave out. Mm. But the other areas, he doesn't know as much, so he just teaches everything he knows about it, essentially. Mm. Ah, and that is a thing, scientists can know so okay. much. And how, and this is what we were talking about, how do you decide what to leave in and leave out? And mm. I'll tell you one thing, if you're talking to the public, leave out the Latin names of the species. <laughs> No one wants to hear them. No one, is that really even what you want them to learn? Do you want them to walk away knowing the Latin name of that species? Yeah. No, and when you speak exactly. Latin, their eyes roll back into their heads and they forget everything. Yeah, yeah but isn't, don't you run the, the, the risk of uh, saying things that are not uh, factual? That, I mean, you check your facts. <laughs> I, okay, so I am all for accuracy and uh, I would, yeah, I, I want you to communicate accurately and I want to, communicate accurately. It's just the amount of it, the level of detail and the choice of details. Um, it's really hard. I don't know how you teach it to someone, but when we hear something, we hear all these things and then we go, ah, that is really compelling to me, the non-scientist. And I think other non-scientists will find that compelling. But I don't, I don't, I definitely want to be accurate and I don't like the phrase dumbing it down. But if you fall into an information, if you get an information that is super important, that you realize that this, you know, people have to know, it, it gets serious. What do you do with that? You know, do you make a comedy out of something really serious? Weird? Yeah, so like I don't know, like uh, an infectious disease or something that <laughs> could have an impact on humanity. Okay, so personally, this is not my field. If I learn about an <laughs> infectious disease, maybe I won't talk about it. What but, is your field? Uh, Golf balls and waste no, on... <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, you, you said uh, that scientists are overwhelmed by facts and they don't always know how to choose the right one to get people interested. And let's take spiders, for example. In, at school, you will learn the names, Latin names of spiders, name of uh, every body part of the spider, but what if... Apis lacris, qui est une abeille laborieuse, par exemple. What if instead of this, we, we will teach uh, in school the amazing uh, behaviors of some species, uh, species. I think about uh, a, sp a species of spiders where the, the male uh, makes gifts to the female uh, to, you know, reproduce. And uh, so he brings her a gift. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, uh, some grass packed with, uh, I don't know what, what he can find. So he brings her some kind of box and while she opens it, he, okay, <laughs> and, some, and sometimes... You want to elaborate on that last step? Yeah. I didn't quite... <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes, and they are incredibly smart, uh, some males uh, figured out that they didn't even need to put an actual goodie inside the box. <gasps> so sometimes they just... It cheats! They, they, they put, <laughs> sometimes they put poo inside oh. the box and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, they finish their job even before the female has opened it. So they already went, gone away. So I, I think, oh. 
those kinds of, of facts are um, a lot of... Uh, Bound to make the front page of science newspapers or but journals. It's very, very much interesting than learning the Latin names of species. So right. I think or we, even we the need... parts of the body, the thorax yeah. and all that. So like, we, that's not as interesting as that. I, I think we, we, we need both, but our job is to light the, the little, uh, you know, uh, spark and then the real teachers and the real scientists take uh, the relay. Uh, the relay, the relay, the information? The, 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 the relay, yes. Mm -hmm. But I think it's complementary. Uh, we well, have... it's an art, and I think you're both great at it. And I'm sorry Thank we you. have to end here, but it was great to have you both on stage mm -hmm. and travel to Montreal and enjoy your time and your Journée Internationale de Culture Scientifique. Merci à tous d'être venus. J'espère que vous allez avoir une excellente conférence. I hope you have a great conference. I'd like to thank our speakers behind scenes. It is a meeting at the Botanical Gardens. Would you like it in French or in English? My thesis in three minutes. There's also a following panel on Friday. And please return your headsets at the table behind the room. Thank you for your your attention. I'd like to thank ACFAS uh, for asking me to uh, moderate uh, these panels. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hope to see you in uh, San Francisco.